There's a very familiar quote that people who don't learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. But I always say it's important to remember the other side of the equation, that uh, people who don't study the past also don't get the chance to repeat it, right? to see not only the things that have gone wrong in the past, but the things that have gone right and the lessons that we can learn from those too. I think it's really important to study history because we have to learn where we came from as a people, as a country, as a culture. And unless we know where we came from, we can never move forward. Because where we come from really shapes who we are today. So the history talks about that our culture, our law, has been raped. It's a sad story, but that's, that story needs to be told so that the world can understand, the world can know that what is happening in the other corner of the world, which has been, which has been a hidden gender, has to be publicly known and proclaim. The civil rights movement gains momentum across Australia in the 1960s. They fight for the right for simple things, to swim in a pool, try on a dress, give birth in hospital, to be served in cafes and enter hotels. They are part of a bigger movement sweeping the globe. As the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. A man called Eddie Koiki Mabo, a labourer, will take his personal fight to the highest authority in the land. He dares to challenge the very establishment of Australia. This is the story of a man, a rebel, a free thinker and a restless spirit, a husband and father, who saw far into the future and even further into the past. The earth will not vanish. That's the law and the fundamental belief. It's this soil here, the land, that's our law. It's has been existing before the colonization of westernized world. Across the country, the clash between worlds continues as the oldest culture in the world is besieged by its youngest. One such place is northeast Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory, the home of the Yongu people. Gullawinku on Alco Island is the largest community in the region. The culture is alive and well to this day. We are not here to fade away. We are not here to die out slowly, but we are here to retain our, our heritage, our beliefs, our spirituality. 
During the late 1800s and early 20th century, whilst much of the country was being colonised, the Yolngu gained a reputation as proud warriors who fiercely resisted any occupation by outsiders. Today, whilst their culture remains strong, their future, like that of other Aboriginal nations across Australia, is under threat. My name's Kenobi. I'm a single mother with four children and nine granddaughter and grandchild, no grandson. And I'm being a strong grandmother, but living in a place awkward. With three family for themselves, only a three, three bedroom house. Hidden from the eyes of the world, two thirds of Aboriginal people in remote communities like Gullawinku live in overcrowded housing. This is like the overcrowding of a house. Just this one house. Several times we brought our kids into Huwenden when they were sick and the doctor would see them. We didn't have a vehicle at the time and there was no way of getting back. We had to go to the nearest pub or whatever and ask for a room. And for all the times we used to come in, the pubs didn't take us. They wouldn't accept black money or probably they thought we leave our skin on the sheets. Even through winter, you know how cold it gets out there. We would sleep on the railway station platform with the two kids. And because of that, I thought something would have to be done. We'd have to start to get political. Quickie mabo. In Queensland, the first Australians live under government laws which have the power to detain and control them on state reserves. We'd been told all our lives that we were nothing. We'd been told by our teachers, uh, by the police. We were abused, we were violently assaulted, we were excluded, we were thrown off trains. We were spat on, and with greater and greater numbers, it was possible to say, we will not tolerate this constant abuse. Koiki's story begins on a tiny island off the coast of Queensland in what is called the Torres Straits. His people call the island Mare. Outsiders know it as Murray Island. My lifetime on Murray, I think, was the best time of my life I ever spent. Growing up on Murray, I was going through my traditional education. It was done by my dad. He took me through a whole lot of things to try and make me realize that white beliefs were not the only ones. We also had value 
in house as well. Quickie Mabo. When they were living together, 20 or 30 people in one, one house, it's ridiculous. For health, it's like living in um, 700 years in Europe. We have to be overcrowded because there's no more housing. And there's promises like housing is going to be built, yet we're still waiting for that houses. Medical research has consistently shown the link between overcrowded housing and infectious ear, eye and skin diseases, all of which are now widespread in Gullawinku. diseases and uh, illnesses that are commonplace in the uh, third world but ought to be unheard of in a rich industrialised country like Australia. The, the levels of those in, in many Aboriginal communities are appalling. <laughs> Health and mortality statistics in remote Aboriginal communities are some of the worst in the world. On average, an Indigenous person will die 17 years younger than a non-Indigenous Australian. Child mortality is three times higher. It's a huge indictment, I think, of Australian government policy over recent decades that things have been allowed to get this bad. Despite decades of government attempts to close the health gap faced by Indigenous Australians, little has improved, with Aboriginal life expectancy now the lowest of any Indigenous group in the world. When Koiki is a teenager, he is caught drinking and with a girl. The islanders have incorporated strict Christianity into their world and Koiki is to be punished. The white manager, Paddy Caloran, offers Koiki a choice. Exile or a year of hard labour with no wages. When I got caught, I was sentenced to keep away from Murray for 12 months. I had an argument with Paddy Caloran and his policies are what I it house. He threatened to put me on his green truck and work for no wages at all. I refused. Quickie Mabo. Koiki opts for exile and begins working on the luggers. Torres Strait Islanders, because of their limited formal education, couldn't expect really to get jobs that were more than labouring. Labouring as cane cutters, labouring on the railway lines, doing other jobs that were manual labour. That's the only work they can do. You reckon a black person, you are, you got no brains. It's only the only work you do is railway and cut canes. It's a poverty. We live in a poverty. But that wasn't our problem. We were rich. We were rich when we were living alone in our country. Before the arrival of missionaries in 1942, the Yongu lived a nomadic life on their ancestral clan estates, now known as homelands. In olden day, people used to get buying or sickness at all, nothing sickness. Nothing healthy, healthy all the time. Because gata in Aboriginal food is, is balance. It is on the luggers that Koiki begins to question the inequalities he finds. White workers are paid higher wages than those given to black workers. Frustrated, he jumps ship in cans and makes his way to the cane fields of far north Queensland. 
It is here that he meets the love of his life, Benita. She was 16, I was about 20, and we sat at the same table. I was dying to meet her. She was very attractive. She carried herself pretty well. Yes, with dignity. Quickie Mabo. It was in 1957 when he came to my cousin's wedding. That afternoon I was putting decorations up. Now this guy was standing at the door. And he, he was, and you know how you feel, oh, somebody's watching you? When I looked to the door now, he was standing up there. Well, I was ashamed and I got down off the chair and I wouldn't do it. That was it. I was about 22, I think. She was 17. Then we got married. Quickie Mabo. Yolngu people doesn't live in one place, one, one place all the time. They move from place to place. Mainly missionary people stay, make us stay in one place and he was raising um, house and all those. In the mission like Kaliwenpu and many other places, we were being taken away from our estate, our country, where there is a value, where there is... Um, A taka, we were really good taka. A good food, a natural food. We were taken away by church, by the welfare. We've been taken away. We were put into the yard, and we said, they said to us, stay in the yard. If I went to the local shop and there were white people in the shop, it was automatically assumed that I would have to stand at the back of the shop and wait till all the white people were served and then I could go forward, and it didn't matter how many white people came in, I could wait there all day, but I couldn't go forward until white people had been served first. Sometimes it used to make me that wog. We used to sort of go away and think, well, I wish I wasn't black, Yeah. Even when I went to school, I, I was told that Aboriginal people were very bad people. On the wharves, Union men urge Koiki to agitate for change. But in these times, anyone who stirs up change is easily labelled a communist. But in these times, anyone who stirs up change is easily labelled a communist. Terrorist, communist, villain, all these words were interchangeable and used in abundance so that the aspiring activists freedom fighter deemed terrorist by the oppressor would have lack of influence and global support. Anything goes. And I believe that one of the big problems with Chris Harney was that as an ardent uh, communist, he didn't believe in the almighty God anyway. Uh, and I saw him as being part of the Antichrist. We orchestrated yeah. it and did it. You know, it, again, it's just, it's that, you know, I love the ruse is always like, we couldn't let this guy Lumumba be in power because he might share the vast wealths of the Congo with the Russians. With the Russians. But we are going to kill him because we want the vast share of wealth of the Congo for us. Yeah. But there were, I don't believe there was any evidence ever that the guy was no. predominantly communist or anything Not like that. He was just looking out for the good of the Congolese people. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, it's, it's like the, the Honduran death squad, death squad, same it's principle same from last thing. week. You've got leaders in place and, and it takes so long for people to come forward and that's why things like whistleblower laws are so yes. upsetting yes. because when, when we do something bad, there should be checks and balances. When we're, when we're pushing over that line of, of being good people in general, there should be somebody who speaks up. And again, and like North, kind of like North Korea, how can we possibly point the finger at them and say, look how terrible and evil you are when we have such a terrible track record? England right. has such a terrible track record.
those of us who were asking for equal rights were cast as anti-Christian, anti-civilization. Our words were the works of the devil. And so there was a, a right-wing hysteria about us, you see. And then there were accusations that we were trying to create a separate state and we were black nationalists. You know, half a dozen of us were going to create a separate black state. There was people there who, whilst they might have agreed to what we were doing, but they would never come out and march with us or march behind the plane, so to speak. The first thing they thought of, that they would be jailed. Oh, yeah, you had to be gutsy, and he was gutsy. Um, he, he sort of wasn't, wasn't scared of anybody. He'd stand up and, and say his piece, you know. The Advancement League was regarded as a communist organisation. Everybody would look at me as a red como. But it, that sort of didn't worry Eddie at all. He, um, he just said, no, I want to do something for my, my people, and, and they're the one that's listening to us, so we just go with them. And then they, they sacked him from the harbour ward and said that he was a communist. The imposition of this new way of life has been shown to cause ongoing problems for Indigenous people in Australia. People who are predominantly based in townships, they don't get enough exercise. Their nutrition is much poorer and uh, subsequently they have greater rates of obesity and high blood pressure and greater rates of diabetes and heart disease. Indigenous Australians are now up to 40 times more likely to die from diabetes than non-Indigenous Australians, a disease that had never existed before the arrival of Europeans. It was in our dream to come to the yard. It was in our dream to come and eat in a white man's table. It was in our dream to come and wear a white man's clothes. It was in our dream to work for the white man as a slave. We were free people. Throughout these changes, which in places like Gullawinku have only taken place over the last 70 years, Indigenous people have been expected to fast adapt to Western society. People who here, they don't understand. They don't understand how to live. Living in a Balandes world, that person should have an education first. Somebody to come and help that person or show. But they just come and growling at people. On top of these rapid changes to their lives, their traditional systems of law and governance have been undermined by white authority. Balanda is pushing Yolongo. Balanda is trying to say, look at my way. This is a better way. Koiki eventually gets a job as a gardener at the ironically named James Cook University. Although he is happy here, he has been in exile from his island for over 10 years. Well, Dad, his memories of Murray Island came out through his artwork. He'd always draw Murray Island. I remember when I was growing up looking at him and him drawing it all the time, that Murray Island came easy to draw. All of us could draw Murray Island. We'd never been there, but we could draw it. It's a longing for you to be there because that's where you originate from. That's where you come from, that's where your mother and your father is, where your ancestors are buried. The longing is still there because uh, it's your home calling and your spirit calling you back to where you originally came from. When he was a gardener at the university uh, and I would wander over to the library, you know, it, uh, quite regularly I would see uh, 
Koiki, a black labourer sitting at uh, one of the uh, desks with these reports on the Torres Strait Islanders going through these and, uh, you know, I would stop and uh, say hello to him and say what, what he was looking at this time and it was, I can still remember his pointing out to me that some of these anthropologists and uh, linguists, etc., had got things wrong. Noel Luz invites Koiki to share his knowledge with his history students. Koiki tells them about the land he owns on the island of Mare. I thought, gee, uh, I'd better point out to him that he doesn't own that land, it's Crown land. And he was totally shocked uh, at that and uh, said, you know, I'd like to see anyone take my land off me, you know, that sort of thing. He couldn't understand why they were questioning him about this, about him owning land. He just knew that he did, you know, because his father gave it to him and therefore, you know, then he'll hand it on to his children. But, you know, for them to question, it was like someone slapped him in the face. My father told me, son, this land will belong to you when I die. Kwekimabo. What's been happening in the last hundred years or more is that we are ascending into two laws. Our own law and the Western law or the Balada law. The law that was introduced to us, a law that is now being a practice in this country. For generations, the lives of Aboriginal people have been controlled by government departments based thousands of kilometres away, who have devised laws and policies without the involvement of Aboriginal people. The government has done many damage by trying to establish an organisation which will control uh, Aboriginal people, like Aboriginal affairs, welfare, if we for native affairs, then the indigenous affairs just to look after us like we were a little child. Our law has been ignored, rejected. In the Northern Territory, another group, the Yolongu, have also been told that their land is not theirs. A company is threatening to build the biggest mine in Australia on their doorstep. They paint a petition asking for the mine not to be built. The Yulnu people said, look, we told you this place is inhabited by our ancestral spirits and there are certain sacred sites here which you have to respect, but you haven't done that. You're going to bulldoze it. And so when it dawned on them, that they in fact had no rights to their land. They obtained the services of a legal team. The Yulnu people said, look, we're gonna take this to court. And it's about ownership. They argued that it was their land since time immemorial, that they'd inherited it, that they had laws, and they gave substantial evidence, which the judge Blackburn could not deny was persuasive and Blackburn overruled their demand for native title on a technical legal issue. That is, that Australia could not recognise their laws because of the acquisition of British sovereignty. In other words, the Terra Nullius Doctrine. He's got brain tree scarring, hasn't he? Yeah. You know, the... My baby... 30 years of research have shown that in order to improve Aboriginal health, communities must be given back control of their own lives. Aborigines are not consulted about policy and planning. In many places, Aborigines want to be involved and really care enough, but they don't... they can't get involvement at other than a most menial level. And this is appalling, this is particularly so of West Australia and in the Northern Territory. 
and they should be in fact uh, making decisions and being consulted effectively. Aboriginal involvement must be improved. Only then can their health and their pride and dignity as a people be restored. The British had wrongly settled this country. The assumptions underlying the British and their history was something that Aborigines disagreed with, but we've never given the opportunity to disagree with it. Mabo was searching for an answer to the question, how could it be argued rationally that the British come along and say this is ours when it clearly isn't and that that for all time is taken as unchangeable law? <laughs> In response to Blackburn's court decision, a tent embassy is erected in protest on the lawns of Parliament House. Well, if you're Aboriginal and you're used to living in fringe camps, you put up a tent. You know, the fringe people, the dispossessed people, it becomes highly symbolic that the Aboriginal embassy should be in a tent. The embassy was an affront to that whole structure, saying, look, if you're going to disrespect our views and twist them around and give us one thing when we ask for something else, then we're going to disrespect your laws and we're going to camp until you give us land and give us an understanding that you understand what we mean when we say land rights. To this day, however, this specialist research has been ignored. Ongoing disempowerment and decades of inappropriate government policies have caused the health of the Yolngu, like other Aboriginal nations across Australia, to spiral. In 2007, Gullawinku had a glimpse of hope that things would finally change in their community. Well, uh, Minister for Indigenous Affairs in the previous government, Minister Honourable Malbrap, when he came here, oh, he introduced himself, we were really happy, oh, we got this man. Where, what's the material that you're using here? I don't mean the other. He came here, promises that he's going to give a 50 house, he's going to give a good health, there'll be education and classroom, new buildings, new houses, everything. That was his promises. You know, we said to him, look, this is good. This is the way things need to happen. And so there was a lot of that discussion. But when we start to look serious about things, when we start to stick, start to put our head together and start to talk about serious things, that's where the bombs start. And we said, now I'm, now I'm minister. It doesn't happen this way. We cannot sell a value of land or lease it for a long time. This is, this is, this is the only hope for us. Billions and billions and billions of square in the continent of Australia, you already bought it. You're not satisfied. Why? What do, you, what do you want more land for? Go back. Don't tempt it as to sign. So he went back. The federal government is about to intervene in Aboriginal communities in a way thought unimaginable just a few years ago. We have decided to act. The decisions we have taken are non-negotiable. 
The Prime Minister has rejected criticism of his radical plan to curb Indigenous child sexual abuse. The government's actions came in response to yet another report on the underlying conditions in Aboriginal communities, this time on the symptom of child abuse. Where there is unemployment, poverty, alcoholism, drug taking, overcrowding, you can guarantee that those children at some point are going to are severely at risk and eventually are going to be sexually abused or abused in some way. The first recommendation of the Little Children a Sacred Report once again urged the government to commit to genuine consultation with Aboriginal people. I do not believe in any way, shape nor form that the recommendations flowing from that report reflected the urgency. In an unprecedented crackdown, the Prime Minister moved to take control. Every single one of them has pedophiles operating in them. Now that is a national emergency. The government will seize control of Aboriginal townships and access to lands will be opened up. We need to have control over the homes, the conditions that they are in, who is in them and what is occurring in those homes. I don't think you can respect power structures in these communities when clearly those structures have failed to deliver. Among his sweeping changes, dozens of extra interstate police will be sent in and 50% of welfare will be quarantined. It is interventionist, I accept that, but what matters more? The constitutional niceties or the care and protection of young children. Whilst declaring the Little Children a Sacred Report as cause for emergency action, the government ignored nearly all of its 97 recommendations. I was shocked. That was not the response um, that one would expect to such a, a sensitive issue. The government didn't speak uh, to community leaders or uh, talk to the Aboriginal community or get any advice. Um, they just went and did um, what they did. That's what this is about. This is what we're trying to do. We, we need a proper consultation like, from your government. Yeah. Come in here and give us... Well, we've already done it. Yeah. We've already done it. We've already done this it. is already law. Yes. Right. And the reason for that is that it was an emergency. Mm. We, we basically a bit upset too, like as being a landowner. Yeah, what do you... What, we, haven't, we haven't been consulted. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, No, no, well, we... we, we uh, no, that's right. I acknowledge that, that those people, like Rich, have got every right to be a bit cross with me because there was no consultation. And the only, only thing I can say, there was no consultation with anyone else either. Back in Townsville, with no government support, Koiki begins the first phase of his vision. He starts a black community school. The black community school that Koiki Mabo set up was when I was young, famous in the Aboriginal movement, because he was the first person to do something about the proposition that we should not lose our culture. For him, that was the defining element, if you like, of being an Indigenous person. Without your culture, you are nothing. You are a shadow. He's empowered us with that cultural sense. He's empowered us with this, the sense of knowing who we are. And um, he's empowered us with the thing of when you go forward, you go forward as, you know, we're Torres Strait Islander, and you'd be proud of, proud of that. Oh, he had a strong belief that he, he can do, he can help change, you know, make it better for, for, for especially for the, you know, his children. He wanted everything to be better than what he had. She supported me all the way. She was there all the time. I was able to discuss things with her, talk with her. She doesn't get carried away the way I do. Kuikimabu. We believe that our homelands is very rich of mineral inside. The government is after the mineral in our land. 
Australia holds a vast proportion of the world's mineral resources, including 40% of the world's uranium. Many of these deposits are found in the Northern Territory, where mining is the region's largest industry. 53% of the land in the Northern Territory falls under Aboriginal control, control which was taken away under the Northern Territory intervention. The government is just hungry for more money. They want to dig more land. They're just finding an excuse to move, move our family out of our country, our own country, you know, our, our birthright where our, where our initiation grounds are and move us here. Under the new homelands policy, Aboriginal people will be forced off their traditional lands and into the main towns, further exposing their country to mineral exploitation. Quite clearly, the government direction and the government policy is to end our identity as peoples to end our association with our territories. This ensures that the governments have control and ownership over all resources in Australia and that there will be no opposition. So our people are still confused. Our minds are not resting. Our mind is like a computer because you are coming and putting that little sips inside into our mind and saying, go, 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 until you, till you die, and then I'll take your land. Koiki establishes services for black Queenslanders who have endured poor housing, substandard health, and no legal representation to protect their rights. The Queensland government has done everything that it possibly can to promote the welfare of the people of Palm Island and the Aboriginals generally. Uh, the talk about poor conditions and the way the people are treated, of course, is simple and absolute nonsense. Bjelke Peterson and his government, over many, many years, believed and persuaded people to believe that Queensland was a state for the white man. So it was a, an absolutely controlling regime. There was fear, there was persecution, there was extreme violence. And there was an extraordinary apparatus to keep a, a regime of fear so that Aboriginal the Aboriginal population, a very large population, was controlled. Australia's violation of the human rights of its Indigenous people is legitimised by its legal system. Australia remains the only Western democracy without a Bill of Rights, and its constitution does not have any provisions that protect the human rights of all Australians. This time of the century, we're sick and tired now, I'm getting old now. We need to change the Constitution of Australia, and now. The Constitution has never recognised the rights of Indigenous people. It was written at a time when Indigenous people were considered to be a dying race and an inferior race. It was also a constitution that was designed to ensure that the Parliament had the power to make racially discriminatory laws. Um, it still has that legacy today. Elsewhere, of course, it was different. It had been different uh, in North America and it was different when the British settled New Zealand and when they settled uh, most places in the Pacific. That is, they recognised that the native people did own the land. And so a settlement was carried out by signing treaties. There's no such treaty in this country. No such treaty. The first people who came here, they said, Australia is a country without a people. Uh, they couldn't recognise that they were people, they were human beings. They were first people of this country. The Latin term terra nullius, meaning empty land, was used by the British to justify taking over the country without any negotiation.
he was getting death threats. You know, people ring up and go, we know where you live. We know how many children you have. Do you know where your children are? He came home from work one day and uh, he said to us, you know, uh, not to go outside and stay inside because he, he was frightened that somebody might, uh, might come along with the gun and sh try and shoot him. So we had the lights off and, uh, yeah, no TV, nothing. We couldn't do anything, just, you know, sat in the dark. He resorted to him and Mum sleeping in the lounge with a shotgun. I put a mattress out in the lounge room and he'd sleep out in the lounge and I'd sit on the chair just to... I'd sort of one goes, you know, go to sleep. So you just keep a ear or anything. In the midst of Koiki's political activity, he hears that his father is dying. Under the law of Queensland, anyone entering the islands must first get written permission to visit. They weren't going to allow him to land on Murray to spread his own belief there. But he wasn't going to spread his belief at all. He was, just wanted to go back to see his father, who was sick at the time. I think um, with the permission being denied, they were trying to break his spirit. But it, it didn't, if anything, it made him stronger and more determined to do what he needed to do. Koiki's father dies without seeing his son again. Uh, that's the si sad part of that, of that story there, uh, the life, in the life of uh, Eddie Mapo. And uh, that was one of the main things that actually triggered him to fight for his rights. That is to make sure that uh, he'd be able to fight against, you know, against the Queensland government, against anything that was standing in his way. Uh, so when the opportunity presents itself, he took it with both hands. Where we are standing now, too far as that camera can see, still sovereign land. It belongs to somebody, or the land does own someone. The land does own someone. It's a younger person. Australia remains the only Commonwealth country not to have signed a treaty with its Indigenous people. Until the issue of a treaty is, is um, looked at and solved, till that negotiated settlement has occurred, that le question of legitimacy is always going to be hanging over Australia. So they perhaps need a treaty as much as Aboriginal people do. And for Aboriginal people, it would be a mechanism to be able to get legal recognition of many of the things that we've lost, the protection of our languages, our culture, our history, rights to education, health and housing, rights to dignity, all of those sorts of things. There are more things to be done. Sovereignty needs to be a challenge. The changing of the way of dialogue the things have to be done through negotiation. But you need to be very, very careful that you talk to the right people. And the right people are the boon leaders, not the leaders that you raised them. You have shaped them and say you are the boss. It's not my man, it's your man. We Yoruba people, have been waiting patiently for a long, long time to sit down and talk, talk about our issues, sort out our issues. You tell us what, what we're doing wrong and we'll tell you what, we, what you are doing wrong. And we'll meet in the middle yeah, and, and somehow create a better partnership than what it is now. Back in Townsville, Koiki and others organise a land rights conference. Koiki addresses the delegates. In the Torres Strait, land ownership is the same throughout. The system has existed as long as we could remember. The land was inherited always by the male descendants. During his lifetime, he would make sure that his family and friends 
knew which one of his sons would be heir to his land. None of the land will be ever sold for cash. Kuikimaku. The initiating factor in the Mabo case was a conference held in Townsville in September 1981, which was on land rights and racial discrimination in Queensland. And from that conference, instructions were given by Eddie Mabo to start a case. I first met Eddie in 1982, and he spoke to me about his planned case. He said first, well, you know, Blackburn said that uh, Aborigines don't have rights to land because they have communal rights or interests. He said, well, we Torres Strait Islanders, we're completely different. We have vegetable gardens. We have our own houses on these small islands. So he's wrong on that one. It, it, the land was owned by individuals, passed down from individual to individual, and the European mind could understand that. And I realised. He'd read it, he'd analysed it, he'd seen what arguments could be put up, and he'd said, mine is the ideal test case to, to run it. But in my own mind, I thought, they'll never win this. It's just too big. You can't overturn the whole uh, legal situation on which Australia was settled. Most of the community didn't really believe that you could upset the government, upset the country. Uh, even upset Terran alias. On the 20th of May 1982, a statement of claim over Murray Island and its surrounding waters is lodged by five Torres Strait Islander people, Selua Sully, Sam and Dave Passy, James Rice and Eddie Koiki Mabo. With assistance from legal aid, they assemble their legal team. I suddenly realised that uh, the Quinton government, for instance, or Australian government, we're claiming our land, and I was saying, that's not your land. You came from England, not from here. So that was the reason we took the government. And government is big, it is big. But uh, we were not aware how small we are. We only knew who we were. Koiki and his co-claimants, with no available funds, seek support from legal aid. To the best of my understanding, judged by statements in the Queensland Parliament, they thought we were a bunch of southern communist do-goody, do-gooder lawyers who should be, uh, who should not be granted a visa to enter Queensland. The Commonwealth Games are to be staged in Brisbane and black leadership seizes the opportunity to organise a mass land rights demonstration to shame Joe at his proudest moment. What was at stake for Australia in the lead up to the Commonwealth Games was a showpiece to the international community that here is a state in the Commonwealth of Australia that has no land rights legislation at all and a denial of Aboriginal self-determination such that people still live on reserve communities which are governed by white public servants. We can build Australia together. Don't think that your people can only build Australia. We can build, we will be part of it. If our right is recognised, if we are being put into the same level, not as a second-class citizen in this country. We have an opportunity for understanding you know, the oldest culture in the world, oldest living culture in the world, and we seem uninterested, as if it has nothing to offer us. It's an opportunity that no one else in the world really has, except us in Australia. If the athletes were centre stage, so were Australia's Aborigines. They took their battle for land rights to the streets and for the first time were seen on the front pages and the television screens of the world as the foreign media poured into Queensland. What do we want? Land rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Land rights! When do we want it?
Violent clashes erupt as police, under Bjorki Peterson's directive, clamp down on protesters. The Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at that time was interviewed and he said, oh, our Aborigines eat goannas and they don't wear clothes, so, you know, they don't need money. And he said that to the international media. You know, the people on the reserves and up there, if you want to use the argument, I mean, they think our department's very good. You know, we supply all sorts of uh, food stuff to them and that sort of thing. I don't think that uh, they're really uh, advanced to a stage when you could give them free whole land and this sort of thing because they wouldn't know what it was. You see, uh, you, uh, the, these people basically have never been used to having money much. You know, they, they normally uh, live out in, um, in areas where they don't use much and they sort of uh, catch birds and goannas and all this sort of thing. To the surprise of the Queensland government, the Islander's case begins hearings in 1986. The case is called Mabo versus Queensland, and Koiki is the first witness. He endures cross-examination by Joe's lawyers. He was subject to a very lengthy and, and a determined attack in cross-examination by Queensland. And he kept saying, my girl, they're trying to um, discredit me and I said what does that mean dad can you explain that a little bit more for me he goes well they're trying to dig up all the dirt they can on me and I said why well, you don't have any dirt do you and he goes no I might have a parking fire but quick was ready you know that's why he said that uh, my strength comes from the domain that I belong to you see that's that's where I get my strength from being a Marian. I'm standing in my domain. These people, are, they, come, they come from, they are outsiders. They come to fight me about something that is mine. I want to tell you what I know about my people and culture did not come from books written by academics. My textbooks were my parents and all my people of the Eastern Torres Straits who contributed to the knowledge I now have. Koiki's evidence is interrupted by a bombshell thrown by the Queensland government that threatens to destroy the case. We have to show show other, other people who are coming in, especially non yolmo who are ignorant of, of the existing culture that is here, that existed before, before the flag was raised at Botany Bay. Their law is only a couple of hundred years old. Our law goes beyond. It's like looking across the sea and you can't see the end. That's how far our knowledge reaches. It's never ending. Standing strong in my culture, keeping culture alive. Standing strong in my culture, keeping my love alive. Standing strong in my culture, keeping customs alive. Standing strong in my culture. Seems to me that it's going one way. You all know are learning Balanda way, westernized world. It's about time that Balanda has to learn our culture and respect. Standing strong in your culture. People don't have rights to change who we are. We can't change you, so you don't have the right to change us. Now, as far as we know, what happened there was Queensland's lawyers looked at Eddie's statement of claim and said, well, he may have a chance. And Joe, in his no-nonsense manner, said, well, even if he's got a chance, we've got to do something about it. Let's just legislate his claim out of existence. 
and it basically said, look, the Torres Strait Islands became part of the colony of Queensland in 1879, that any property rights that the islanders had are hereby extinguished as of 1879 with no compensation payable. The law was enacted. That left us in a, in a very difficult position. If that was a good law, that was the end of the case, full stop. No, no, no case. So Koiki Mabo's legal team took that statute to the High Court as an act of racial discrimination and the High Court ruled that it was racial discrimination and uh, ruled it invalid. Outside the courts, Australia prepares to celebrate the bicentenary, marking 200 years of European occupation. About 200 Brisbane Aborigines gathered at their traditional meeting ground at Musgrave Park to prepare for the 2,000 kilometre bus trip to Sydney. Five days before Australia Day celebrations and protest is already evident. At the same time, hundreds from the Northern Territory and Western Australia have already travelled thousands of kilometres through much of South Australia and Victoria. Before they go on to Sydney, they'll meet busloads of people from Tasmania and Melbourne. All up, nearly 10,000 protesters from... The first Australians descend en masse to Sydney, expecting the Prime Minister to fulfil his bicentennial promise of a treaty a hope of resolving the unfinished business the nation has with the first Australians. But it meant nothing, and there was no commitment, and uh, nothing happened. And then he cried publicly on television that he hadn't done enough, and uh, we can only agree with him. All hope for any recognition for the first Australians now rests on the outcome of Koiki's case. He returns to the island of Mare with his lawyers and the entire Supreme Court. Koiki shows the judge the boundaries that mark his land. This is the one here. And from here, it goes straight into the bush about 100 yards. And this is the the boundary line here. These sort of things that can be seen all over this island. Other families have constructed these things, not just lately, but over many years. In 1990, Moynihan announces his recommendations to the High Court, whilst he acknowledges that a form of land ownership does exist. His findings are a crushing blow to Koiki. At the core of Moynihan's decision was that he did not believe Koiki's adoption was lawful and therefore was not the heir to his father's land. Remember that the core of the attack by Queensland was that Eddie Mabo was not the person he said he was. The core of the attack was that Eddie Mabo was not adopted from his natural parents to relations of his on Murray Islands, Benny and Maiga Mabo. His natural father was a person called Sambo. His mother died within weeks of his birth, so that uh, in 1936, he was adopted island way under customary adoption. The child was given to a family who could not have children of their own. B, in Dad's case, having a single father trying to raise a small child and going, I can't do this, I'll hand you back to your mother's brother. So now uh, he's taken on the Mabo family name, and that becomes real. Sometimes it's, it's not even um, recorded down in the white man's law that uh, such a child has been adopted. You know, but they recognize this uh, through the, their own traditional way of adoption. If it's put to you, you are not really uh, Eddie Mabo at all. You're somebody else. You're going to resent that. And he did. And I think rightfully so. Prior to the case being heard in the High Court, two of the other claimants had died. The case now moves forward, primarily focused on the evidence of two claimants, James Rice and Dave Passy. After 10 long years, the High Court judges adjourned to consider the evidence. 
Indigenous people wait anxiously for the outcome, as does Koihi back in Townsville. I knew he was getting sick because he'd, he'd constantly walk around the yard and he'd be hitting at his hip, he'd just be banging on his hips and he'd say, my hip's really, really sore. What's wrong with him? Tell me what's wrong with him. And the doctor looked at his book and he shook his head. He said, I don't know what's wrong with him. He had cancer and this cancer spread right through his body. And by that time, it's about his lungs and he couldn't talk properly. And even through his illness, he was just you know, making sure everybody was there. Go to that court case, go sit in for me. You know, I can't be there, so you, I need you there to go and listen for me. Late at night, from Koiki's hospital bed, he writes. I lay in bed thinking about the future and how I would like it to be, even if I am not here. I thought about the struggles I had been through over the past years, while the rest of Black Australia awaits with me for the High Court decision to be brought down at any time. Or would it be in time? I also thought about my wife, the most important person in my life, the most adorable person, a friend closest in my life, a most wonderful lover, and we loved every minute of our lives together. Kwekimabu. Eddie Koiki Mabo dies in Benita's arms on the 21st of January, 1992. Five months later, the High Court advises they will deliver their verdict. I then rang Murray Island. I spoke to a lady at the phone box at the council chambers. And I said, do you remember Eddie Mabo's case? And she said, yes. Well, I'm ringing you from the High Court building in Canberra, and the judges have just handed down the decision, and Eddie Mabo's won his case. And she went, oh, screams and yells, and phone fell down, there was great clattering noise. And she seemed to rush out of the phone booth, and I heard this strange noise proceeding in the in the distance as she announced the news to people on the island. And uh, that was a special moment. I just walked down just towards the church with my hands up. We've won, we've won, we've won. And I do that when I... <laughs> Malo's hand. Sorry, this is true. David Passy explained what the Marbo case was about. He held up his two arms like this, and he said, we have Marlowe's law, and then there is the white man's law. So what we've done with this Marbo decision is we've brought Marlowe's law and the white man's law together so we can have a law which is right and strong. You know, at the, at the end, you can see that everything he'd done was for everybody. It wasn't just for him. It came out all right in the end, but then um, he wasn't here to, to, to receive all the accolade that he, uh, he would have received here. But still, his name is up in lights and it's in history and uh, it will go on. Eddie Mabo is shine. For the first time, Australia has recognised that the first Australians were indeed the owners of the country prior to European occupation. 
This is time to ask the black people to talking about. To what's happening like this time to our life, more limited on black people are alive, more we have to speak up ourselves. The one day you're standing at the strong beer, when in the you up with the wind, you're when it's the wind. Tara ka wanga, when the government, the muk maram. Next up, Aboriginal land claims. How safe is your home? The state governments, the pastoral industry, the graziers, and the mining industry formed an unholy alliance and gathered in Canberra and they ran a multi-million dollar campaign to depict the Mabo findings of the High Court as utter evil, as the end of Australia's land tenure system would produce anarchy, would destroy our economy. They're being asked to pay taxes to fund people who are seeking title to land, productive land, to which they've made no contribution to its productivity. The Mabo ruling on Aboriginal land rights is set to cause uproar, with claims it could lead to a form of apartheid. It says if you bought a block of land after 1975, your backyard might not be your own. It was an outburst of vile race hate and it was insane. Claims of premedicated genocide, systematic and widespread massacres, now frequently cited by the guilt industry, are total nonsense. The people had a terrible time, there's no doubt about that, because of the clash of cultures, two totally different cultures. But uh, to suggest there was some policy of annihilation, I'm, I'm sure is wrong. And most of it was completely and absolutely wrong. Koiki's people gather to honour him and celebrate his life with the islander tradition of a tombstone opening. This is time now where we rejoice that we know that his spirit is rest in peace. That his spirit... But the celebrations are short-lived. Overnight, the tombstone is badly vandalised. family make the decision to return Koiki to his island. Uh, the last Chris Christmas we had with him, uh, he, he drew a mud map of, of the area of our uh, last village where he wanted to be buried. So he's happy now where, you know, back home where his ancestors are buried there too, all the way up in, into the back of those hills there. It is that spiritual affiliation. You are not by yourself. You, you belong to that soil. From that soil you were created. And when you die, you should go back to the soil. And that tie, the bond is unbreakable. You to your land, to the, to the soil. It's a time that the leaders, Aboriginal leaders, said to get together, to put their head together. I'm talking to you, Mob, now. All my Kuris friends, all my Maoris friends, my Nongas friends, and the Yolngu people, Bening people, we've been divided and conquered, divided and conquered. Get away from it. We have to start fighting together. And then he said to me, uh, you know, I. Uh, I really do believe that um, even though we don't really have support from, from people out there that much, but the freedom will come uh, for the island people. Not only the island people, freedom will come for the Aboriginal people. And also freedom will come for the white society as well. And I said to him, well, I can understand you you know, with, if you fight against the terra nullius and you get rid of that, uh, you can set the Ab Aboriginal people free, the islander people free. But how, what do you mean that you're going to set the, the white society free, the white people free? And he said, 
Because the white society is living a lie. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they see us, but then they say we are not here. And that's because of terra nullis. So they've got a big chain around the neck. They've got a, a chain around their minds. So they are bound just as, just as much as we are. And he said, so uh, uh, with terra nullis out of the way, uh, we are no longer just shadows anymore. If they want to talk to us about anything, they have to plant us as a person now. Before we were just shadows, we were non-entities. I say, but now they will see us for what we really are, indigenous people of the land. Thank you for watching False Camera Action. Before you go anywhere, don't forget to click subscribe.